all of the adjustments and all the right everyone's attention here now remember that we said when the lord turned again the captivity of zion we were like them that dreamed right then was our mouth filled with laughter and our tongue with singing and we agreed yesterday that the turning of the captivity of zion means that the lord must have done something impossible in the sight of men right come on come on come on come on and that means it will have been impossible in the sight of men now i need you to understand that i mentioned something yesterday i want to lay foundations on today you will find out that the bible used the word again all right that means that there must have been a scriptural reference as to when the lord turned the captivity of zion can you see the word again there Oh, okay. It's, it's not scripture that is there. It's, can we put on this screen? Okay, use your Bible, all right? Did you see the word again there? When the Lord turned again. Oh, yeah. Who is in that media room? Thank you. When the Lord turned again, the captivity of Zion. That means the captivity of Zion was once turned. If we check the patterns of the Lord turning the captivity, we can tell how he turns the captivity. Are we together? And uh, So we can know what to expect if this scripture is by any means prophetic. Yesterday, I did my best to disabuse our minds from private interpretations. And I showed us very clearly that Zion is not me. Zion is us. It's always us. And that means that the purposes of God as enshrined in the scriptural concept Zion. What I'm trying to make sure I do in this teaching is to make sure that the next time you hear the word Zion, something comes alive inside of you. Are you following me? So the scriptural concept called Zion can never be I. It is always us. If we travel the way I expect us to travel today, we'll end in Hebrews chapter 12. Right? So when the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion, we were like them that dreamed. Then was our mouth filled with laughter and our tongue would sing it. All right? And I told you that by the time you hit verse 4, give us verse 4. 4, 5, 5, 5. No, 4. 4, please. Turn again our captivity, O Lord, as the streams of the south. This indicates, number one, that this turning is something that has a reference, like I said, from something that he had done in the past. This turning also refers to the fact that that he has done one stirs up our faith to expect for more. Right? Because the possibilities of God, I told you that that's what a testimony is supposed to do. A testimony is supposed to put before your eyes the possibilities of what God can do. So that faith then makes... That when you find that kind of thing as a barrier in front of you, you are not even challenged. Your heart is not. You are just thinking, Lord, how? Not, Lord, will you? Oh, come on, come on, come on. Do you understand it? So that if you stood in front of a barrier, if you are asking, Lord, how? It means that your heart has got faith in the knowledge of God that this is nothing for him. He can do it. All right? So, the record in verse 4 of turn again our captivity, O Lord, as the streams of the south. Then, verse 5 and 6, which is where we closed yesterday, we agreed that he that sows in tears shall reap in joy. So, they that sow in tears shall reap in joy. Then he now narrowed in. This is the only place you saw something personal. He that goeth forth and weepeth. Come on, come on. That means this one is not they. This one is he. Right? The only personalized verse in Psalm 126 is verse 6. He that goeth forth and weepeth. That means it is not they that weepeth. It is they that sow in tears, but it is he that weepeth. Ah. Are you following me? That means that what gives us our company is our tears. I'll come again. Verse 5. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. Verse 6. He that goeth forth and weepeth. That means the harvest is going to come from many tearful people. 
right? But every one of us must have our individual weeping to contribute to our collective mourning. That means, if I ever stuck with you, it is because I found out that the same way I was sowing in tears, you were sowing in tears. Then, all of us together become they that sow in tears. Are you following me? It then means that mourning then becomes a blessed accompaniment for a collection of believers. I'll come again. At that point, mourning becomes a blessed accompaniment. Now you understand how the Lord Jesus arrived at saying, blessed are they that mourn. Are you following me? Because it seems to be that the blessedness is tied to the mourning. And the mourning that comes from a heartbreak is not blessed. That's not the, the mourning that God blesses. Do you understand it? The heartbreak that comes from either breakfast or your father die. Do you understand, Do you understand it? If they serve you breakfast, it's not blessed that they that mourn. That's, that's not. Contextually, it has, it has no contribution to the kingdom. Do you understand it? So blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted, has got an order in scripture. You want to see the order? I saw you two scriptures that will strengthen that so that you understand it. That means, before we go to that order, it means that one of the marks that creates our company is that we are a company of blessed mourners. Right? But we don't join a company of blessed mourners until we I, he that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed. And I explained to you yesterday that our weeping is only justified by our seed. That means we don't belong to those who weep and do nothing. <sighs> do you get it? I think it's important I drill that in so that you understand how Zion operates. That means we don't belong to the company of them that weep and do nothing. When we weep concerning anything, if anything becomes deep enough to cause us mourning, what happens is we start to look for the seeds to sow to heal that which is now causing us pain. Do you get it? So if we are weeping that a generation is getting lost, what is our seed sown? It's evangelism. Do you understand it? So you are not qualified to be registered among the mourners of Zion until the seed you are sowing. And the seed is sown constructively in the direction of tears. Do you understand it? So that I know that before now, most of the interpretation you have concerning mourning in Zion came with the thinking, oh, he that goes forth bearing precious seed. Then they are thinking sacrifice. You are thinking offering. Do you understand it? And yet, you will find out that the tears of Zion, I'll show you two different other scriptures. I will show you that the tears in Zion are always in the direction of what you see that breaks your heart. All right? Before the two scriptures. Psalm 136. All right? Is that Psalm 136 or Psalm 138? By the rivers of Babylon. Where's that? 137. Psalm 137 verse 1. The Bible says by the rivers of Babylon, we sat down and we, when we remembered, that means an accompaniment for Zion seems to consistently be weeping. Eh? Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Jack, sit, sit here, sit here, sit here. Hello, are, are we not seeing anybody? Are you taking care of anyone? No, don't, it's okay, don't, you're all right, come sit here. Akinen, do you want me to call your name? See, see seats. I'm just trying to make sure that the empty seats are gone so that we don't... There's even one here. Which should I move here? Which should I move here? Okay, so let's keep going. Let's keep going. Are you getting blessed already? Okay, well, two, yes. Don't worry. When we keep going, you will get blessed. You'll get blessed. At some point, you'll get blessed, all right? Are you understanding it? So, the Bible says, by the rivers of Babylon, we sat down, we wept. Yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. That means what was causing us to weep is the remembrance of Zion. So what did they remember? 
you will now be thinking that they remembered freedom and they are crying because they are in slavery. No. No. They knew that there was no way they could have ever been in slavery unless Zion had been lost. So Zion is not the city they were taken from. Zion is the system of God that they had stopped operating a long time before anybody could take them into captivity. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. That means what they know is that if Zion was in place, no nation would have been able to put us in captivity. So when we remember Zion, it's not when we remember the place they took us from. It's when we remember the place we fell from. Because if we remember where we stood, the covenant and the promises that are bound to that place make that no nation will have been able to tread upon us except that Zion is not in place. Are you following me? I'm tempted to take you to the beginning in 2 Samuel chapter 5 and show you how David took the fortress that was called Zion. It used to be called Zebus. That's the land of the Jebusites. Let's, let's yield to the temptation. Listen. In all of Israel's conquest, in all of Israel's conquests, there were two lands that seemed to have been deeply fortified. You know how Jericho was when they were entering into the promised land? You know how Jericho was? It was Baba who gave us a description of Jericho and its, and its conquest. And he told you that by the time the walls of Jericho fell down, they saw women tying rapper on their chest. Oh, you see, it looks like me and you are not always in the same service. Do you remember it? That they saw, saw people washing clothes. People with toothpick and toothbrush, they are waking up early in the morning. That means everything Israel was doing outside the walls of Jericho did not put panic in Jericho. Why? Because Jericho was such a fortified system. That system was so fortified that nobody in Jericho thought that there's anything these guys can do about us. They can take all the nations around us, but the fortification of our walls made that we don't even need to put an army together ready to fight. That's why the Bible listed Rahab in the hallmark of faith. It takes seeing with the eye of the Spirit to know that our nation has already been conquered. So, count me into your nation in the day God gives you this nation. Are you following me? The second time you saw that kind of a fortification in scripture was at Jebus. Look at this. 7 Samuel chapter 5, from the 6, and the king and his men went to Jerusalem unto the Jebusites, the inhabitant of the land, which spake unto David, saying, Yes. Yes. Do you understand what they just said here? Give me a newer translation. No, go on, go on. Give me a newer translation. Give me. You have NLT. Give it. Okay, message. Leave it. Leave message. David and his men immediately set out for Jerusalem to take on Jebusites who live in that country. But they said, You might as well go home. Even the blind and the lame could keep you out. You can't get in there. No. They had convinced themselves. Do you understand it? Did you see the insult? Do you think they were actually trying to insult David? I, do, you, do, you, do you think that they did not know that David was coming with the mighty men you heard about? Just in case you are not able to connect this to what I'm actually saying. What I'm actually saying is that right now, that's how the world sees the church. I was waiting for the point when you will see it. That's how the world sees us. They think that all these are praise, worship, and all these are our... <clears throat> when people finish, I mean, Babylon is intact. In fact, part of their confidence is rested in the fact that there's Babylon inside church. That's <laughs> what so they're thinking. By the time people are done, when you collect a small frame, buy your small land, 
Do you understand? Get your small car. Leave that thing. When you are done, our blind and our lame will keep you out. Those are the only kind of things that when it happens, we will be like them that dream. Now you are getting it. It is when out of that same church that looks weak, out of that same church that looks defeated, out of that same church, church that looks like nothing will come out of, then suddenly the kings of nations are bowing to our light and ends of the earth to the brightness of our rising. Kings are not able to take decisions until they consult. Do you understand it? In that day, when the mountain of the Lord's house is exalted, it will be like a dream. Because in that day, the systems of God will permeate the nations of the earth. And the same nations, the same nations that thought, no, the church can never amount to anything. It has been destroyed significantly. We'll sit down. That's what the world is saying about us. They're thinking, our blind and our lame will keep you out. Most of the things the church is still talking about and fighting, as far as Sodom and Egypt are concerned, are still the blind and the lame. The core of where the power that governs Babylon is sitting, we are not talking about it. We are still talking about secular musicians and Hollywood. And where the darkness sits, you have not approached it yet. So when they are sitting down, they are looking at you, what they are telling themselves is our blind and our lame. Does it make sense to you? But let me tell you what I like about scriptures. If you read the next verse in 2 Corinthians 5, the Bible did not dignify Jebus with the description of the warfare that took it down. Let me help you understand what I mean. You'll find concerning other matters, and Israel was in battle array against Ai, Ai. And AI came out with 17,000 men, and Israel came out with 170,000 men, and it was a great battle that day, and Israel trusted AI. Scripture did not as much as honor Jebus with the story of how it was taken. See the next verse. Put the next verse on the board. But David captured what? The fortress of Zion, which is now called what? So, the first, the beginning of the concept called Zion is Second Samuel chapter 5. So, you now understand. Uh, now you understand. They that put their trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be moved, but abides forever. What does the next verse say? As the mountains are round about Jerusalem, so does the Lord surround his people, both now and forever. So it gives you what the confidence of Jebus was. They already had mountains round about them because the same location you call Jerusalem today, the same location they call Zion then, is where the Jebusites were sitting. And so the description in that psalm was actually giving you a physical picture. Ah, uh, let me add you a more physical picture. You sit on the plateau. Usman Danvodio did all of his jihads from the north. Conquered everything, north and all the way to the Kanemborno Empire. But every time he arrived at the mountains of the plateau, he was resisted by, from the hilltop. So these regions we are sitting in are the only regions that Fodio could not capture. It tells you that the mountains themselves are fortifications. Is it making sense to you? Now, I can turn to the mountains and describe for you the fortifications of Babylon and why Babylon believes that we cannot penetrate. But that'll be a story for another day. Or maybe when, I, when I'm gone again, Pastor A will sit down and break it down for you. So that when Babylon sits down, they are thinking of the system with which you educate your children. 
And they are thinking of how to take that system and make sure that before your child is 12, 13, everything you attempt to teach him in children's unit has been sucked out by everything the educational system teaches him. Do you understand me? So while you are innocent about education, Babylon is looking for how to fortify that mountain to be so that you arrive at a point where after you are finished preaching your gospel, when he arrives at that mountain, it loses its strength. So the blind and the lame that are hiding behind Babylon can keep you out. Now, don't get it wrong. You need to understand that where that fortification is that seemed impossible to capture was when was what was captured and was renamed Zion. Let me explain to you in simpler terms. The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdom of our God and of his Christ. That means God does not want to do anything different from what the kingdoms of this world are doing. I quoted that psalm for you so that you understand that the confidence in the description of David was the same confidence that Jebus had before the mountain was taken. Do you understand it? That means... If what they are doing, Pastor Ampi, if what they are doing is they are building systems that educate our children, that make sure that by the time your child is 13, he has room for every kind of sexual orientation that did not exist in Scripture. It then means that when the kingdom of God comes, we too would have had a teaching system that makes that when a child is 13, he cannot deny the existence of God. Many times that's why I end up referring to Micah chapter 5. Because in Isaiah chapter 2, he spoke about the mountain of the Lord's house and its exaltation and told you how the nations will come to it and say, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord's house for he will teach us his ways and will walk in his path. Micah added a subject when he wrote the same prophecy. Isaiah. He said, and when that day comes, we will walk in the way of the Lord our God and the nations will walk in the ways of their God. That means, listen to this, listen to this. God is not as interested, no, it won't be correct. He's not willing that any should perish. But part of the justifications of God's judgment is not that all men are saved. It is that all men make a choice by reason of a full witness. Does it make sense? He's not waiting for the whole world to be saved. He's waiting for the whole world to have a certain sure witness of who he is. So that when men are making their choices, they were not making their choices deceived. You know, I don't know if I said this here or it is that I said it on the road. I've told them in many cities. No, I think it was on the road I said it. I said it in Gombe and I said it in Zaria. I told them on the road. I said, Your, the Bible tells you to fear God and I agree 100%. But I want you to add in your Bible, fear man. Let me help you understand what I mean by fear man. See me, I found something in scripture. I weak. I think I've said it here. I said it here. I found it in scripture. I weak. That Jesus, the Christ, will come to the earth and rule it with a rod of iron for 1,000 years. And when he is done at the end of 1,000 years, throughout that 1,000 years, no deception, no sickness, no death. After that 1,000 years, Satan will be released briefly so that he can just pass by and greet guys. Yeah, oh boy, how now? Yeah, how now? Then the Bible says, those who will follow Satan to make war against Jesus and his saints will be as many as the sand of the seashore. It changed everything for me. It changed everything for me. Listen, I cannot be disappointed that I preached the gospel and you did not give your life to Christ. I cannot. I have lost the ability to be decided. If Jesus will preach his own gospel for 1,000 years and his gospel is not come, let me take you to heaven. It is that in that season, his king of kings, lord of lords, governs the entire universe, shows you the ideal of the rule of God. Then Satan will pass by again. Then men will choose Satan. Okay, Manta. Manta, look at it. And, and shall go out to deceive the nations. 
which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle. The number of whom is as the sand of the sea. Oh boy, fear man. I brought back this fear man subject to say to you, Fali, the calling is to give an accurate witness so that no man is subject to the deception of Satan. Because the way the systems called Babylon are structured now is such that in generations coming, the argument will be that there was never a time when men married women. There was, it was always that men can marry men, women can marry women, and then the ones that choose men can marry women. It's one of the reasons why one of the subjects Satan fights the most is history. I heard Baba Kwashi say, we need to send more people to study history. It sounded very foolish to me. Because you, they ask you, all right, they ask you, what course will your son read in the university? I'm not saying by the grace of God, medicine. Doctors are suffering now. <laughs> Leave the matter. By the grace of God, nanotechnology. Then I heard Baba Kwashi say that we need to send many more people to go and read history. That we need to send our people. Because listen, it's not that Satan shut down the subject. It's that he sent people to distort true history. So right now, there are people who are arguing between the Bible and the Quran, which one is true? Because the Quran tells you that the blessing of Abraham was a punishment. Found anywhere, no trace. So Jesus is not only alive in the Bible, he's alive in history. And of course, naturally, History is always distorted now. Do you understand this? So what does Islam tell you about Isa? I'll tell you what Islam tells you. It tells you that he was not the one who died. That at the point when he was supposed to die, God exchanged him. Unfortunately, you are writing the story of Arabia. You are not writing the story of Yehudia. Do you understand this? You are not writing the story of Israel. So, how do you have a stronger record of what happens in Israel than what happens in Arabia? Why did the book take the time to establish Isa as a prophet? Because history has now established that Isa was not Arabia. Isa was Israel. Am I making sense to you? Now, I'm saying that to say to you, that when Jude said earnestly contend for the faith, he wasn't only talking about you contending for what you believe. He was saying, there are going to be wars. Peter said, be in readiness to answer concerning the faith that you believe. In fact, in as little as the crisis that is happening on the plateau, if we don't take records and write properly to say 82 people died in this village, and all of them was, were of Irigwe origin. Five years later, some guy will come with Balhe and tell you that 72 out of the 82 people that died in Irigwe land were flooded. And what he writes is what history will record. So history is distorted the moment you permit a lie to try. Listen, I'm saying this to say to you that some of you, your battle for the faith is with the pen. There's a sweet spirit in this house right now. I know when the anointing comes. I know when the Lord is satisfying the things I'm saying. If you don't understand it, you'll be thinking that the faith is only that we went out to do evangelism and we're trying to protect. No, 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 no that's not it. We need to enter into the villages and set the record straight. So that if you were a media person or a journalist and you are reporting, oh, it's three people who died. Eight 
30 of Irigwe origin, 3 of Fulani origin. Somebody is going to say to you, why are you, you are writing divisive news. No, somebody is looking for how you can leave the story vague so that he can distort history. So that in 10 years, when they come to battle for the lands, they can say to you, this land was originally Fulani. Then they'll bring you writings of writers who were sitting in Arabia and taking record for Israel. Because if history had not proven now that Anabi Isa was not Arabia, Anabi Isa was Israel, we would have been arguing in time whose record of Jesus is accurate. the mountains around about Jerusalem so that the Lord surround his people. I'm saying that to say to you that what Babylon is building or has built is such a fortified system when they look at us they are telling themselves our blind and our lame will keep you out. But when the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion we were like them that dreamed I thought I would hear a better amen there. Yeah. Understand it. Understand it. The truth will prevail. And it will prevail in our time. But it will also prevail by the seeds we bear. Yeah. Do you understand where we are coming from? He that goeth forth and weepeth, what? Bearing precious seed. So we can't get up, see me, and say it's a lie. They are just lying against us. No, we have to bear precious seed. In the midst of the weeping, somebody needs to sit down and write. Someone needs to go across the villages and say, please give me names. Names. I want names. I don't want 73 people died. I want names. So that their names will tell you where they are from. By the time they see a gum, Azi, Ajang, You cannot come and say that one. That's why I blessed the day the plateau decided we are going to return back to the original names of places. So we we'll get up and say, This is Birkin Ladi. This is Hain Kaswa. This is Bachin Trailer. No, we adopted names that were not originally the names of the places. Why didn't those people arrive and respect us enough to call our places the name we call them? It's because they knew they were at war. You didn't know you were at war. They called it consistently and glorified the calling of it until you stopped calling it what you called it. And started calling it what they call it. Because when you call it what they call it, you feel like you belong to a class. It's the same thing westernization has done to us. Do you understand it? So we feel like we are accepted publicly when we dress like English men. This is not England. This is Africa. We have done more development as far as tradition and clothes is concerned than England will ever do. And you can say it's just clothes. You know I don't have problem with clothes. I wear their suit. I do. Even though you know I don't like it. I wear it because I have to look like a pastor. It's our uniform. Are you following me? You can say it's just cloth. But that, those were the means by which, from the days of your colonial fathers, they made your fathers feel like everything that came from the West was superior than everything that came from here. So we embraced Westernization and equated it to civilization. So even us are now writing in English our uncivilized fathers. And yet, history teaches us, I'll answer you, sir. And yet, history teaches us that we were civilizing according to what was available to us. Do you get it? And I don't have a problem with it. I'm just saying to you that normally when Babylon steps into a place, the first thing it does is it designs the curriculum of Babylon, establishes it as a fortification, and writes it in the mind of your children as the ideal. And what becomes ideal on the earth 
is what men accept as ideal. Let me hear you. Yes. I believe strongly within me that your type, that, is God, that God has raised at this time is for a purpose. And people who are following after you on the plateau, especially on the NATO belt. In 2001, when the crisis started on the plateau, we were so concerned that we formed an association. I belong to that association. And the, our concern was that we discovered that one of the things that gave the enemy stronghold or power to which we were on the plateau was the disunity. Okay? Now, we started going from village to village on the plateau. I'm an evil man. We started going from village to village on the plateau to educate the people on the need to come together, agree to come together. Now, we were impatient. In one secondary school, the people gathered. I was talking. I was talking. So when I talked to a point, a man came and asked me, So I was reluctant to answer him. When he persisted, I said, I'm an Igbo man. He said, to now, now, when he was saying that, one of the people that went with me, his name is Lomen, took the microphone and said, I asked the man, what this man is an evil man, but what he's telling you, if you do it, in which way will you benefit? That of what calm the, the, the situation, sir. Now, I was ashamed one day when Solomon La was on te national television, was on a debate with Yahya Kwande. Yahya Kwande asked him a question that made Solomon La to bow his head. He asked Solomon La and said, you say you are Wallen Lantan. Is that not your name? You say you are Wallen Lantan. What is the meaning of Wallen in Lantan language, in Tarot language? Why can't you bear your language, your own native, bear it in your own native DC? Kai. So that's in agreement with what you're saying now, sir. Yes. So I want to say, please, sir, keep it, keep firing. <laughs> <laughs> well, in the spirit of keep firing, I told those who heard me a few weeks ago, those are the reasons why we're calling for an Ingas Christian Youth Conference. And yesterday I upscaled it. We're also calling for a Plateau Christian Youth Conference. <laughs> I upscaled it in the air. When I was coming back, I was looking down, and the Lord began to speak to me. So we'll deal with the gas station first. Then we will turn. Then we'll face plateau. We will raise a fortification here. We will rename our state Zion. They, will, they won't know why. Now, listen. It is the remembrance of Zion that made those boys weep. It is the remembrance of how fortified Zion was under David's care that made those boys weep. Let me show you something. Can you go back to Psalm 125? 125 from verse 1. Can you see Psalm 125? Did I just quote it? Eh? They that shall be as which cannot be but abiding Next to us, as the mountains, uh -huh, so the Lord is round about his people, uh -huh, from henceforth and forever. What's the verse 3? Read verse 3 aloud. For the rod of the wicked shall not rest upon the Lord of the righteous. Why? So that. Verse 4. Finish it. There are two more verses. Finish it. Finish it. Do good, O Lord, unto those that be good, and to them that are upright in their hearts. Next verse. Yes.
If not, we'll wake up and find out that we're being overrun. If not, we'll wake up and find out that Babylon has closed us in. If not, we'll wake up and find out that everything we built was going with the wind. Can you see how they follow each other? The sounds. You can see that they were deliberately arranged by the hand of God. And for those of you who are not here when I taught Psalm 127, I'll give you a brief background. I taught here and I told you that the Bible didn't say except the Lord watches over a house. It said, except the Lord watches over the house. Which is the house of, sorry, except the Lord builds the house. Which is the house of the Lord that the Lord told David he could not build. And because David couldn't build it, the Lord, David was now writing to Solomon. Because if you have a topical Bible, you, you see it there. A psalm of David for Solomon. So he was saying to Solomon, the Lord will not let me build the house. Oh, you will soon see that David is our case study if you are going to talk about Zion. Because nobody loved the house of the Lord like David did. God told David, you will not build the house. Your hand has too much blood. Because the house requires the, the cleanliness of priesthood. I will not let your bloody hand build it. But you know, you don't understand that until you go to Psalm 132 and see the vow of David. Go to Psalm 132 and see the vow of David. You can as well keep reading these Psalms. Take off from Psalm 124 and keep going. You will see it is all Zion. Till you get to Psalm 140. All Zion. Lord, remember David and all his afflictions. You would think that they are telling you, God, please, as Saul wants to kill David, as uh, his son Absalom wants to take him over. You'll be thinking that those are the afflictions there. That they are. What are his afflictions? How he swear unto the Lord and vowed unto the mighty God of Jacob that what? I will not come into the tabernacle of my house nor go up into my bed. Stop. David had built the palace but was sleeping on the floor. He said, so that I don't get comfortable with this palatial life and forget that while I'm living in my house, the ark of the Lord is intense. What kind of love for Zion is that? You know, we have not, we have not actually read Psalm 137. It was in Psalm 137 they swore and they said, let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. Let my right hand forget her skill. If Zion is not my chiefest joy. No, he didn't say Zion is not my joy. That means that if anything is wrong with Zion, something is wrong me, with me to be happy about anything else. That means for me to be joyful about anything else, Zion must be intact. And you see it in scripture. Nehemiah lost his traction. Because they told him the walls of Jerusalem are down. We still keep going. Things are wrong in the house of the Lord. People still keep going. The best they do about it is the gossip. But I figured, I, is somebody hearing me tonight? God has to write love for Zion in the hearts of us. What kind of love did David have for Zion that made that David was done with local life? Judah had crowned him king. Ishbosheth had died. Israel had called him and crowned him king in Israel. Then he built the, the, his house, his palace. Then David got up and vowed a vow to God that he will not sleep on his bed. Go back. I will not give sleep to my eye or slumber to my eyelids until I find out a place for the Lord and habitation for the mighty God of Jacob. Next verse. He 
said, Lo, we heard of it at Ephrata. We found it in the fields of the woods. That means David was not only planning to build for God. He was planning where to build, with what quality of material to build, how, what kind of nobility. Oh, Baba reminded us in Gombe this weekend that David heard that the house of Obed-Edom had prospered because of the ark of the Lord. David said, we are going to go and bring the ark of the Lord. Have you read that scripture before? The Bible says he found priests because the first mistake he made was to put it on a cart. And God killed uh, Uzziah. And Ellie said, you're right. God killed Uzziah because of it. This time, he heard that the house of Obed-Edom was prospering because of the ark of the Lord. He carried priests. They carried it on their neck. Listen to what scripture said. Every six steps they took, they caught a sacrifice. <laughs> Every six steps, they caught a sacrifice. They laid it on an altar, blessed the Lord, moved another six steps, and caught a sacrifice. How long would it have taken them to go from Obed Edom's house to ascending Jerusalem? If you want to understand what it means to love Zion, read David. I told you a bit of it yesterday. That the priesthood of Samuel spanned from Saul to David. Would have gone all the way to Solomon. Long after Samuel was there. And David, long after Samuel was dead, cannot permit himself to see the oil on the house of Saul as corrupted. Because to accept that the oil on the head of Saul is corrupted is to accept that something is wrong with the priesthood of Samuel. David, you should fear David. So I told you yesterday, when the Bible says that Jesus was going to be born in the order of David, it wasn't just talking about the natural seed. Of course, the natural seed followed. But there was an order. There was a love, a zeal. King finished building his palace after living many years in the wilderness. He didn't shout, Uhuru. It not sound blessed the God, it is over. He finished building the palace with a palace bed. Then Psalm 130 told you that he swore that. Then by the time he now said to the Lord, I want to build the house. Then God said, You can't build me a house. Your word was. But your son will build me a house. If you hear the utterances of God concerning the son, you will know it cannot be Solomon. It cannot. It cannot be Solomon. God said, I will spare him. And even if he sins, I will. He said, and by him, I will make your throne everlasting. Your throne will last forever. If you read the covenant of God that he spoke to David, when he told David, your hand cannot be raised. Let me tell you. If I was David, I'll get up. Lift up holy hands. Do you understand? Maybe that's the night I will write, Karbizu Tiata Adayar Then I will lift up my hands so that I can see Duba Luna. By the time I drop, I will pack my things from the ground. I will climb on top of my bed. I say, even the Lord. You know David didn't do that. When God told him he could not build, he went out and started gathering everything Solomon will need to build. Since God did not say, you cannot gather. Do you think it is for nothing that the Lord established the reign of David? If they say to you, you cannot build, say you will rejoice. At least you, you can now eat and drink and sleep and rest. I've tried. David didn't say, I have tried. Do 
David started gathering everything Solomon will need to build the temple. So by the time Solo came, he was too useless to not build the temple. Do you understand me? All you needed to do was put these things together. Some theologians did the calculation and said the amount of gold that David kept for Solo to build was 11 trailer loads. Your long body trailer. 11 trailer loads. I speak, if you see 11 trailer loads, they bring and make you build the mat. What do you go do? <laughs> How does one man gather that kind of offering? Do you understand it? The real question tonight is how much love for Zion is in your heart? Because if you love Zion, if anything affects Zion, it will break your heart. Let me tell you. I don't claim love for Zion like David does, but I can tell you. I can depart from any man for taking a position against God. Any man. If you are the only person that God will use to make me, go and perish. Let me perish too. And I'm not talking zeal. I'm not saying, oh, anybody who just says anything against God, I'm against. No, no, no. People have seen me do it a number of times. Maybe you have just not recognized it. I stood up against my entire tribe. My entire tribe. <laughs> Even family tried to advise me. Take this position. I said, I know what the Lord said. I thought, I can say it on TV. I've not taken a couple from the government. Not a couple. If anybody has given to me, let them come up, comfort and speak. But the fortification of Zion, I can lay my blood for it. See, when it comes to the things that are divine, <laughs> your love has to be deeply sentimental. And it has to be. People need to know if we touch good, we know where he stands. And there's nothing natural. Listen, I have preached over the years. A man of the spirit does not have the luxury of sentiment. The moment there's a sentiment humanity can hold against you, there's a height in Zion you cannot climb. Because even Satan knows that there are things in your natural life that he knows that if he touches, you will set out one day to serve the Lord and Satan will go to us and touch Nelly to see whether you will slow down. The idea is to see whether you will slow down. I shared with them in Gombe. It was here it happened. I was sitting in church. Oh, yeah, we had moved here. I was sitting in church. I had whole truth in Lagos. Yeah? It was inside that tent. Where? Where? It was in Adulam. Oh, yeah, it was still in Adulam. Tell for service. I had rolled through that day in the evening in Lagos. My wife, we came fine. Then she started one fever. Entered the office. I thought, okay, she entered to rest. The next thing I got a text that she was in the hospital, that they want to admit her. They have not admitted anybody in my house before. Then she sent me a report that she has been admitted. I looked. This was one of those days when I needed to finish sitting early so that I can run to the airport and catch the flight and take me to Lagos to preach. I wasn't preaching for anybody. It was whole truth. It was my meeting. So I would have easily been able to say, please send text to everybody who attends whole truth and tell them tonight's meeting is canceled. I own nobody. I got up from church. I did not check where they were admitting her. They took her to Rayfield Medical Abbey. I did not check where they were admitting her. I headed straight for the airport. I sent her a text. 
And I asked Satan, if I went to the hospital, what would I do that the doctors would not do? What help do I need that God cannot raise if I'm not standing there? I left. I got to the airport. I saw the plane like this. It was in front of my eyes. They were closing the door of the plane. I stood there and I told them, can somebody tell the pilot I'm here? I've done it before in Kaduna. They opened the plane. This pilot didn't even look at me twice. He turned, started his plane, and walked away. Then I stood there and I said, then it is evident that the Lord will have me stand, stay with my wife. So I called my friend in Lagos and I told him, please help me handle the meeting tonight. And then I turned and I went to the hostel. Listen, you can say anything you want about it. Oh, your ministry, your first ministry is your family. You will show me in the Bible. To show me in the Bible. There are philosophies who have arrived at embracing. Let me tell you something. Somebody asked me that. He said, the way you used to travel like this, don't, are you, don't you think that your children need you around so that you can train them? Then I asked the person. The people who work for oil companies, some of them are off, they are on shore three weeks. Back three weeks. Sometimes it takes them one week before they get home. They are at home for a week or two, and they go back on shore and their children don't see them for four weeks and see them for two. Has any one of you given them advice to retire from that oil job because of the amount of money it brings to the table? You even rejoice. I said, mariners, people marry a person who walks on sea. A marina will enter sea for six months. It's not home. He comes back home to the arms of a rejoicing wife and children who have been introduced to their father. Because they don't know how to relate with him. And people give thanksgiving and testimony that their sons got marine job. But it's those of us that are preachers that you are advising that we should leave the work of God and come and sit at home so that our children can be looking at our face. Raise your own children. Let them be looking at your face. We will raise our own like this. Let them meet in the future. Then you understand that covenant is stronger than attention. People just get up. They speak out of philosophy. And the philosophy fills our churches, fills our minds. So that every time Satan wants to obstruct us from anything divine, he knows what to touch. Did you ever read the narration of God as to the congratulations of Job? After he passed his first test, go and read it. Job 1. Uh -uh. Mm. Sorry, Job chapter 2. Verse 6. Job chapter 2. First Chronicles 29. Where now? Okay. Oh, First Chronicles 29. Thank you. I prepared gold for things of gold, silver for things of silver. Thank you. Thank you. Verse 6. No, 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 no. No. 2. Verse 2. Job 2, 2. And the Lord said unto Satan, from whence coming down, Satan said, from going to and fro the earth and from walking up and down in it. Verse 3. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job that what? A perfect and one that feared God and read the rest. One, two, three, go. Yes. Stop. Did you hear that? That means that when the trials came against Job, his ability to hold fast and stay on course 
is what God and Satan used to agree that Job passed the test. Understand? So listen. Don't ever have a greatest treasure that is natural. Not your husband, not your wife, not your children. You shall love the Lord and him alone will you serve. You must make sure that the seat he takes in your heart, nobody can touch it. I told them in church recently. There was a season when, you know, I kept saying it. And of course, my wife didn't like it. And I respect the fact that she didn't like it. I still respect it till tonight. But hear this. What people didn't know, what I, as at that time, I was warring against Satan. Satan kept saying to me, don't worry. The, see the way you like your, your wife like this. She will die soon. So I'll stand up that time and tell you, I'll, I'll be saying it in church. Let me tell you something. If my wife dies today, give me six months, I'll marry another girl. I said the six months is so that people will not even think that I've been doing the runs before. Six months is long enough to mourn, heal, get up, take the next decision. Forty days was enough for Israel to conclude that Moses was dead. Forty days was enough. Six months is long. People thought that it was because I didn't like my wife. No, I was answering Satan. I was saying to Satan, listen, there is nothing you will touch today that will distort my life. It's not possible. Until now, I maintain the same position. I always told them, I said, if I've not married that after six months, it's because of my children. I'm considering them so that I don't marry one witch that looks like an angel of light. I'm telling you. I thought I was the only one. Who, I didn't marry in six months. Baba who died. Sorry. Baba's wife died. I was there for the burial. I mean, we, we did the concert for a burial. Amazing mother. I think two years later or something. Or two and a half years later. Baba said he wanted to marry. Baba. Baba would have been maybe like 65 or close to 70 as at that time. Baba said he wanted to marry. What we found out later was what blessed me. The girl that Baba went to marry was the first girl he asked to marry him who said she was not ready. Before he married Mama. And that babe didn't marry throughout her lifetime. Mama died. Baba returned there. Married her. Both of them, in their close to seven, they had a child. Eh? Did you say twins? Oh, it was twins they had, huh? <laughs> Those twins' children are uncles to boys who are at least 10, 12 years older than them. Because I know Baba's children. I know some of their children. Listen, you can't put a, a man who has sworn allegiance to Zion, you can't put him in despair. The only thing that has the capacity to move the heart of a man who has sworn allegiance to Zion is the things that make for the benefit of Zion. Let me show I told you I was going to show you two other scriptures that will send it. Abby. This whole Zion subject. Hey, I'm not moving fast, though. I need to move faster than this. Have you ever read Psalm six, um, Isaiah 61 before? The Spirit of the Lord God. Please put it on the board. Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Because the Lord had anointed me to do what? To preach good tidings unto the poor, the meek. To bind up, he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. To proclaim liberty to the captives. And the opening of prison to them that are bound. Next verse. Verse 2. 
to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of the vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn. Next verse. To appoint unto them that stop. To give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise Stop. You will notice that the morning in Zion has nothing to do with anything personal. If they say, he is beautiful ashes. Is that, no? Beautiful ashes, strength for fear, right? Gladness for morning, peace for despair. All you are thinking about is, what are the ashes in my life? No. That, that posture is a fasting Jewish posture. A Jew sits in us when he's fasting. So the ashes are not products of your life. The ashes is a posture a man chose to take to show that his heart is broken. Uh, I'll try again. So when a Jew fasts, he fasts in sackcloth and ashes. Ooh, you remember which prophet was it? I think it was Joel. Even now declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with weeping and fasting and mournings. Rend your heart, not your garments. That was. The fasting of the Jew who is compelled by the fact that his heart is now mourning. So David heard that Saul was dead. I'm wondering why the camp didn't break out to shout for joy. Follow me. David, David, David. David is a problem. Huh? They just told him that they just killed Saul. I'm sure that everybody in the camp wanted to start shouting. Then they saw King. His face genuinely fell. He genuinely began to weep. Then he tore his clothes. The Bible says he sat in us from that point till the evening. And all the men with him tore their clothes. Because they are not born you. Your God just tore his clothes. There's no rejoicing that day. That's why one day Joab had to confront David. At the death of Absalom. Because the men felt like we just, this guy, we should pin him straight to the wall. That's not constant. As they were saying, oh, the army has been defeated. We're now ready to go back. He said, what about the young man Absalom? Have you heard about him? Then they told him, may the Lord make all of the king's enemies like that young man Absalom. Then David broke down. Oh, Absalom, Absalom. Then instantly, the wars, the war chant of victory just ended in the camp of Israel. So Joab went inside and told him, Oga, yeah, yeah. Should we have left Absalom to rule? Because right now, the men don't even know what to believe. Sir, if you don't get up down, clear your face, dress up, and come out. We will collect this kingdom from you. I dare. David got up at the command of Joab, cleaned his face, dressed up, came out and started congratulating guys. So I had to put up a smile even though his heart was broken. What kind of a man didn't ever wish evil for his enemies? I need to finish these thoughts on Zion. I need to finish these thoughts on Zion. Is anybody getting, are you understanding at all? Are you understanding it? Zion has to be your true joy. So, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. He said that we might be trees of righteousness, the plantings of our God. Now, let me explain that scripture for you in Psalm 
Don't worry. No, nothing is broken at my inside church. Listen. When Jesus read that scripture and he said, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your eyes. What he was saying was that all of the answer you have waited for that makes Zion weep. I am the embodiment of the answer Zion has waited for. So that ultimately when I do my ascensions and I arrive as Messiah, everything Zion has lost, I am the restoration for. One more scripture. Psalm 35. Ooh. Listen, my problem is that you did not hear what I said. I'll try again. You know there's a hearing in a hearing. Let me try again. Let me try again. So what Jesus said is, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. When he finished reading it, then he said, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your eyes. That means everyone who mourns in Zion is always waiting for one man who, has, who is an apostolic embodiment of the fulfillments that will balance up the scales that has been disbalanced and bring back, as it were, the ideals of God on the earth. That's how I know you did not hear me. I'll say it one more time. So every time Zion is mourning, what Zion is waiting for is one man. A man who becomes the apostolic embodiment of the fulfillments that will balance up the scale and rebirth the order of Zion on the earth. So when Jesus said, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your eyes, he gave you the right, I'll show you in Psalm 35, he gave you the right to also rise up in your day and say, everything that has caused men to mourn in Zion that does not look like what God ordained before time began, today the spirit of the Lord God is upon me and I came to balance up that thing. You understand it? Let me tell you one secret of understanding the New Testament. There's nothing the Lord Jesus uttered with his mouth that you should not be able to say concerning your life and your ministry. So if Jesus says the spirit of the Lord God is upon me, that means I can say the spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Oh, come on. I thought I was talking to believers. I thought I was talking to believers. Do you understand it? So that to bind up the broken hearted means that under my rule, there will be no broken heart. Are you following me? To proclaim release to the captives means under my rule, the prison doors are broken open. That literally means that when I'm done, everyone who was mourning in Zion is mourning the standards of God that have been broken on the earth. When I am done in my apostolic dispensation, you will turn and you will rejoice rather than mourn. So if you sat down within the context of what God has called you, and you look at humanity, and you see the places where humanity is broken outside of the divine order and covenant of God with man, and you permit that to become the mourning of your heart, the seeds will either ensure that you rise up to become the full start of what must answer for that which you mourn concerning, or the seeds you sow will ensure that within your lineage or in the context of your time, you will see the answer for that thing that broke your heart. I'll try to say it again. You understand me? So if I am mourning in Zion, don't forget that we said, how do we mourn in Zion? Bearing precious seed. He that goeth forth and weepeth, doing what? Bearing precious seed. So we don't mourn in Zion and do nothing. We don't sit and say, what kind of useless president is this? Ah, and do nothing. When we mourn, we bear precious seed. We act according to the idea. We do even towards the unstable, the things that the Lord will lead us to do. If the Lord leads us to rebel, we rebel. The Lord leads us to cry, we cry. The Lord leads us to obey, we obey. But whatever we do, we must be sowing it as seeds, declaring that this is not God's ideal. And in the day of God's ideal, this is not what men will look like. You understand me? We do it, do what? Do what? Bearing precious seed. Now follow. Anything you mourn concerning, there are only three possibilities. Number one, 
that the Lord will stir you up to become the complete apostolic embodiment that will answer what you are crying concerning. Or number two, the Lord will ensure that in your lifetime, while your eyes are open, you will see the answer. Because you see, because it is Zion, it is not I, it is us. That means at that point, it doesn't matter to me whether the answer came by me or it came by another. As long as the disbalance is sorted, I rejoice. Because if I don't rejoice when the disbalance is sorted, it means that I sought personal glory. I did not seek the advancement of Zion. The third possibility is that the Lord will spare that it is in your lineage that something will rise in time after you are gone. Whether natural lineage or spiritual lineage, something must honor the order of your discomfort and rise from your natural lineage that will ultimately be the answer. So when David said, the Lord said to my Lord, he was speaking about Jesus, his seed in the natural, his Lord in the spiritual. But he was speaking about the answer to the scepter that governs the whole earth. Listen, my intention is that by the time we are done with this, you will love to mourn. You will love to mourn. Because I told you, oh, I don't know if I said it here. Listen, the greatest treasure of a spiritual man is sobriety. He does not have the risk of excessive excitement. He doesn't have the risk of excessive sorrow. The greatest treasure of the spiritual man is sobriety because sobriety provides the environment for him to accurately, intellectually agree with God. When a man is not sober, he's affected by the excitement of his drunkenness or, ex ex or he's affected by the depth of his pain. So if you hear the psalmist or hear any other writer in the Old Testament, you'll find out that when they're in pain, you will hear... Uh, Jeremiah said, you have deceived me and, have de and I'm thoroughly deceived. My reins inside of me are paining me. Do you understand it? You will hear those things and you will see that in those kind of times, when you arrive at the place when you say to God, I, only I, God will say, meet me at Horeb. It's time for you to hand over. Because at this point, your analysis cannot be accurate. You are bearing too much pain. That means mourning is not personal pain. One is, is the pain that desires to see kingdom come, will done on earth as it is in heaven. Not I prophesied and it didn't come to pass. That's the difference between Jonah and David. Jonah's pain was personal. No, the prophecy came from the Lord. But Jonah's pain is honor me before the eyes of the people. Don't let me speak a thing and it does not come to pass. I'm angry to death. God said, why are you angry? Is there a time you're not doing the city? What I asked, I came, just saw this small tree here now. The tree grew, shaded my head, night has died. God said, you are sounding like you are concerned about a tree. But what you are concerned about is the shade over your head. Shouldn't you have been concerned about the many people in Nineveh who are now saved? You need to understand that Zion is not personal. In that day, it does not matter if God is doing it by God life or he's doing it by winners. It only matters that God is doing it. Do you understand it? Because there are three rights a mourner has. He has the right of apostolic attainment. In fact, Andrew, sometimes God tests whether what you want is apostolic attainment by showing you the signs that somebody else wants to fulfill what you have been crying about. To see whether you will give the person seed to help him fulfill it. You understand? If what I say is, I want to see the lost saved, then I cannot be only giving for my crusades. Every time I hear the Lord has opened the door, 
and crusades are about to happen to save others. I will mop like I will do and send. Because at some point, God has to test, test how personal you have become about what looks like divine assignment. Many times, that's why Jesus established that if you are not faithful with another man's, who will commit to you your own? Because the bottom line is faithfulness. Oh, if you got me, let me hear an amen. amen. Understand it. I am zealous over Zion. I am zealous over Zion. I am zealous over Zion. I will come to Jerusalem. I am zealous over Zion. I am zealous over Zion. I am zealous over Zion. I will dwell in Jerusalem. I am zealous over Zion. I am zealous over Zion. I am zealous over Zion. I will dwell in Jerusalem. I am zealous over Zion. I am zealous over Zion. I am zealous over Zion. I will dwell in Jerusalem. I am zealous over Zion. I am zealous over Zion. I am zealous over Zion. I will dwell in Jerusalem. I am zealous over Zion. I am zealous over Zion. I am jealous over Zion. I will dwell in Jerusalem. I am jealous over Zion. I am jealous over Zion. I am jealous over Zion. I will dwell in Jerusalem. Look at Psalm 35, my second scripture. You need to understand mourning. So you can't live every day and then people are misbehaving around you. And it is not aggregating your mourning. That's what natural living should give you. So if you are sitting around anything that is not according to the ideal of God, you are feeling your heart bang. Oh, I wish I could read from verse 17. Psalm 35, 17. I need to read it in context. Kai. Give me 24. Read the rest when you get home. I don't want to stay there for too long. You want to ask a question? Let me hear you go on. The what? Three rights of a mourner, right? Number one, he, either, he has the right to wear the apostolic garment of the fulfillment of what he is mourning concerning or he has a right to see in his day someone fulfilling what he is mourning concerning. That means somebody else can wear the apostolic garment but blessed are they that mourn, they shall be comforted. So the blessedness is in three dimensions. It's either you are the one who is rising up to solve it or you are blessed enough to see the one who will rise up to solve it. Or you will, God will sustain within your lineage someone who will rise up to solve it. And I said lineage, whether physical or spiritual. And within your lineage means that it is possible to go to sleep in time and not see the satisfaction of your soul. Are you following me? What was that say? Verse 24. Psalm 35, 24. Judge me, O Lord, my God, according to thy righteousness, and let them not rejoice over me. He was speaking about his enemies. 
pastor I'm tempted to go back. That's why I'm... Take us 17. Lord, how long will thou look on? Rescue my soul from their destruction. My darling from the lions. I'll give you thanks in the great congregation. I'll praise thee among much people. Let not them that are mine wrongfully rejoice over me. Neither let them wink the eye that hate me without a cause. For they speak not peace, but they devise deceitful matters against them that are quiet in the land. Who is he speaking about? He's speaking about the architects of Babylon. In fact, the, one of the verses I passed in a hurry was one of the verses that Paul quoted in the book of Hebrews as to him declaring before the congregation of the righteous the things that God has done by him. But let's go. All right? Verse 20. For they speak not peace, but they devise deceitful matters against them that are quiet in the land. 21. Yea, they opened their mouth wide against me and said, Aha, aha, our eye has seen it. This thou hast seen, O Lord. Keep not silence. O Lord, be not far from me. Now look at this. I told you the people that Paul, uh, that David, the psalmist, was struggling against. Right? These are people who cook wickedness. Because you must understand that the moment the world identifies that you stand for Zion, you come against the beasts of Bashan. So when you hear Paul saying in 1 Corinthians 15, if after the order of men, I fought with beasts at Ephesus. What advantage it me if the dead rise not? Listen, the beasts he fought in Ephesus, he told you clearly are men. If after the order of men, that means when men realize that a man has reason to embody apostolically the burdens of Zion, enough to stir up the oil of the spirit upon his head, what happens is that the attacks become personal. Do you understand it? So don't expect that in the day when you take a stand for Zion, everything is going to be alright. No. The priests and the scribes sat for two and a half years plotting how to kill one Jesus who has not done one evil. The idea is that Babylon had sat in the congregation. Now, so follow. Stay up yourself and awake to my judgment, even unto my cause. My God and my Lord. Judge me, O Lord, my God, according to thy righteousness, and let them not rejoice over me. Let them not say in their heart, ah, so we would have so would we have it. Let them not say, we have swallowed him up. Oh my God. Did you hear that? Did you get it? Don't give them an opportunity to rejoice over me. Let's go. Let them be ashamed and brought to confusion together that rejoice at mine heart. Let them be clothed with shame and dishonor that magnify themselves against me. Now stop. Now at this point, me is no longer a man. Me is an apostolic embodiment of the cause of Zion. Mm. Do you understand it? Do you understand it? Don't worry, you'll see it. You'll see it. Let them, what's, ah, let them be ashamed and brought to confusion. Ah, what's 27? This is where I was going to. 27, 27, 27, 27. What do you find there? Let them shout for joy and be glad. Yea, let them say, let the Lord which had pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. Stop. <laughs> what did I just show you? So when scripture said, let them shout for joy and rejoice that favor my righteous cause. He wasn't just talking about the cause of God. 
Let them be ashamed that rise up against me. Let them rejoice and shout for joy that favor. At that point, the cause of the Lord is embodied by a man. So when you favor his cause, you will say continually, the Lord be magnified. Oh, yeah. oh no, 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 no. It's, it's easy contextually. I mean, is it not clear? It's easy contextually. Let them be ashamed. Let them never have reason to say, yes, that's actually what we wanted to see. Because in this Zion, just like in Babylon, the cause always finds an apostolic embodiment. That's why I told you that a man who has money in Zion has three rights. One of the three must come to pass. That means that you mourn is not guarantee that you are the answer. But it is guaranteed that you will identify the answer. Do you understand it? So let them shout for joy that favor my righteous cause. It's most likely those who have mourned, who have suddenly seen the apostolic embodiment in another. Then they shout for joy that favor my righteous cause. So my righteous cause in the context of Psalm 35 is not the cause of God. It's the cause of the man who has become the apostolic embodiment of the solving. Do you understand it? So in the days when Jesus opened Isaiah 61 and said, this scripture is fulfilled in your eyes. Anybody who gave to the ministry of Jesus became they that favored my righteous cause. Listen, until this is understood, we cannot transition from church to Zion. Because part of what will happen almost naturally is that all of us will be fighting a cause that we should have united and strength, sent strength in the direction of one man. You understand? If there is any pain in departures within the context of Zion, this is the pain. The pain is that many times when we depart, we can never be as strong as when we stand together and identify the cause. It's the pain. So you find out that in Psalm 35, he spoke about those who were waiting to see his shame. That's those who build Babylon and prosper in her wickedness. Then let them sing for joy or let them shout for joy and rejoice that favor my righteous cause. At that point, what he's saying is everyone who has waited upon the Lord to see me show up. For instance, the people who, uh, the brokenhearted who he's going to bind. Are you following me? The prisoners who he's going to set loose. The ones who are waiting for the year of the Lord's freedom. The acceptable year of our Lord. Let me, you understand that the acceptable year of our Lord is jubilee. And Jubilee is the year when people go free. That means that within those systems are those who are suffering oppression from Babylon and those who are enjoying Babylon. And most times, mourning is easy for the one who is oppressed. So normally, the cry of Hosanna, Hosanna is the cry of the oppressed. Hosanna means save us, save us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That means, listen to this. One of the ways you show your love for Zion is if Zach, Zach, stand up. If Zach is the one who is progressing and what he is doing now is answering to a cause that we have all been mourning about, we will turn in his direction and shout, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. What's Hosanna? Save us! Save us! Save us from what? This oppression. Save us from this mourning. If what you have done succeeds, then the Lord is magnified. The Lord who takes pleasure in the prosperity, look at it, of his... So this is the psalm of the servant of the Lord. The apostolic embodiment of Zion. If you take it and play it in David's life, you will find 
that for all of the years that David was running from one coral to the other coral, do you understand it? Do you, do you understand it? There was a Jonathan who was favoring God's righteous cause, who as against his personal benefit would rejoice at every advancement David made. You get it. So when we get to an election season, these are the scriptures to pray. Lord, let them not say, where is your God? Lord, in the name of Jesus, they that wait for our shame. Lord, let them not find reason to say, aha, that's what we wanted to see. They finished declaring somebody at Supreme Court that he won election. Nobody shouted. The results should have gone another way. By now, Nigeria will still be partying. It will have been like two weeks of party. Are you, are you following me? Yeah. Let them shout for joy and be glad that favor my righteous cause. And let them say continually, the Lord be magnified. Let's go to Psalm 102. Two more scriptures and I'm out of here. Have you been blessed so far? So lift your voice. It's a year of jubilee. Out of Zion seals, salvation comes. Lift your voice. It's a year of jubilee. Out of Zion seal salvation come. Lift your voice. Here are to believe. Out of Zion seal salvation. You verse 12. For thou, O Lord, shalt endure forever. And your remembrance to how long? Come on, come on, come on. And your remembrance to how, how long? All generation. Verse 13, you will remember this now. Thou shall arise. And what? time is set time. That means set time speaks about divine ordinations and sovereign orchestrations. That means that God would have sat down in heaven and said to himself, 2027, Nigeria will be free. Now, every agitation before 2027 will be preparing Nigeria for 2027. And anyone who understands prophecy knows that it takes a height of trust for God to reveal to you by 2023 that this is not the year of my salvation. You know the reason why? Because you will change your action. And God requires the agitation of 2023 to get set for the set time in 2027. Does it make sense? Now, so many times when God blinds us, it's because of the inevitable humanity that forces response. Because none of us wants to go for an election and have our candidate lose. So if the Lord had told you your candidate will lose, though he's my will, what will happen is that you will back down. And suddenly, the backing down and the laxity in the atmosphere does not generate sufficient strength like God needs it. 
So sometimes there are certain things that you leave out to the sovereignty of God. Just leave it there. I'm not trying to provide explanation for anything. I'm just trying to tell you that many times, if the Lord ever reveals to you, it can change your posture. And so sometimes, not to change your posture, the Lord permits you to go with the things that you instinctively discern are his will. And He is glorified and blesses you for standing with his will, even when his will does not come to pass. And yet, in the season called set time, there's no way his will does not come to pass. So set time is not any time. Set time is set time. And God prophesies set time and permits especially the heated orchestrations before set time to perfect the situation that will strengthen his man for his set time. I'll explain it to you. That, that sentence was too much, right? Was it a lot? Was it a lot? Okay, so let me, let me slow it down so that you understand it. Most times, when set time begins to approach, how you know is that activity increases. If it was oppression, the oppression will increase. If it's pain, the pain will multiply. It's like Israel beginning to feel the pang of slavery. First, he started with, come now. These people are greater and mightier than us. Pharaoh didn't say these people will be greater and mightier than us. He said these people are greater and much than us. Come. Let us send them to go and work. Let's. Then that's when they gave the charge. That anybody who gives birth to a male child. The male child should be killed. Now the moment you start to see those kind of activities. In the natural you feel like we are losing ground. In the spiritual it tells you. That even Satan is smelling that there is a set time coming. And so while he's doing that to reduce your capacity, God is watching that because in the midst of that, he will create sufficient agitation or sufficient mourning for a man to rise up to the stature that can answer that need. Because until there's external agitation, there does not seem to be sufficient uh, draw to call our attention to the fact that this thing must be addressed now. So the increase in agitation and activity tells you that set time is near. In fact, it even became nearer when Moses came to say, let my people go. I hope you know that there were more people in Israel cursing Moses than there were people in Israel blessing Moses and getting set to leave. Because from the moment Moses showed up and said, let my people go. <laughs> Pharaoh says, because these people, we used to give them straw before to build. So we withdraw the straw and we let the poor breathe. Sorry. Oh, did I go there? I'll take it. I'll take it. I'll take it. You know this high professor? Yeah, so just be following me. This high professor. Be following me. Uh, because they had straw, we used to give them straw to go and build. So we draw the straw. Let them go and look for their own straw and meet up the same quota that they meet up in building. So Israel's cry and agitation was heightening and yet set time was come. God required the agitation to posture the apostolic man. Satan required the agitation to posture hopelessness in the heart of the nation that should be saved. So as activity increases, a man who sees in the spirit becomes excited because he knows that these are signs that Satan fears what is about to be born. Follow me. Oh, if I say I will not say this thing, is it not like fire in my boats? Let's see. Ah. That's when the agitation increases. Because set time is set time. So if God is approaching set time and he's not seeing posture for set time, he has to permit Satan to increase activity so that he can hurriedly call those who will hope in him to posture for set time. Sila, I'll not go beyond that. So the problem with set time is that set time is set time. And yet, 
such time is time to finish building because demand is coming. Because the day of the Lord must meet the man of God. And the man of God must be ready in the day of the Lord. I always use the crucifixion of Jesus and Pentecost for you as examples. That the Lord established the feast called Passover and established that they killed a spotless lamb. And so Jesus, the true Passover lamb, had to die on a Passover day at the moment the priest was supposed to be cutting the Passover lamb. Now, God did not need all of that drama for Jesus to save us. Because even if Jesus had died in August, he would have still been our savior. Because every criteria that will make him our savior was fulfilled in him. He was spotless, he was guiltless, without sin, and he took upon himself the sin of us all. So he was our Passover lamb. And even if he died in August. But for God to orchestrate that he dies at the time when the lamb should die. It's so that God will show you that set time is set time and set time cannot be changed. Men in set time will meet up with the standard of God. So when set time reaches, it's not that God uses anything. When set time reaches, the man of God is also full in his stature. If you got it, let me hear an amen. That's always how set time is. So, from verse 13, it's important we read verse 16, then we can read verse 14 and 15. So, throw to verse 16. When the Lord shall build up Zion, he shall appear in his glory. I come again. When the Lord shall build up Zion, that means when he says, the time to favor her has come, you shall arise and favor Zion. By the time favor has come, yeah, the set time is now. It now tells you that the favor of the Lord is not coming carelessly. He is waiting to finish building Zion. Then he appears in his glory. When he appears in his glory, what will happen? Let's do 17, 18, 19. 17, 18, 19. And not, yes, go ahead. Okay, let's start again from 17 to 19. One, two, three, go. Yes, and not despise their prayer. Yes, this shall be written. And the people which shall be created. That means any generation that reads what God does in that day will give God praise. Does this sound like when the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion? Okay, 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 let's go. Next verse. For he had looked down from the height of his sanctuary... From heaven did the Lord behold. That means that it is in that day that all the injustice that God has gathered, he will force the justice of it to come. So while all of Egypt was oppressing Israel, God, the righteous judge, was watching. But he was gathering up sufficient so that when Israel is living, they will live empowered. Because it was by that law of divine justice that made that people who were living were knocking the doors of those who are staying and asking them for gold. And every one of them entered inside their room like Mumu, removed gold and silver and gave the Israelites. So that in one day, God compensated them for all the labor. Do you understand it when the God of justice stops, steps in? So that's what happens. That's what it means for him to come in his glory. The prayer of the destitute is heard. What seems like God had despised his people suddenly changes in one night. So let's go back to the verses we left. You shall arise and favor Zion. For the time to favor her, yea, the set time is now. Then he went to verse 16 and said, when he builds up Zion, he shall appear in his glory. So let's see. Let's go again. Verse 14. Go back to verse 13. Let's do it again from verse 13. Look at this. Thou shalt arise and have mercy upon Zion for the time to favor her. Uh huh. Yea, the set time is come. Right? Next verse. Four. Stop. That means there is a reason why you have to favor her. It's not only set time that is responsible for favoring her. 
She now has your servants who take pleasure in her stones and favor the dust of Zion. Mm -hmm. Just in case you didn't take note of it, let me say this quickly. That means that in the day when God will establish Zion above the nations of the earth, it will take the justice system of God gathering all of the injustices of the earth and deciding the time to pay for all of this injustice has come. If you heard me, you will get some kind of consolation. So every injustice that's going on in the world today will become a, an energy to establish righteous judgment. Do you understand it? Do you understand what it means to be a judge? We have, we have a number of lawyers in church. Uh, Naret, what is you people's primary assignment when you become judges? Is to make sure the scale balances are big. That means that if the injustice has been meted out on one side, to the degree to which the justice scale is tilted, you see that thing that, that that blind girl is holding? You know that blind girl? She's everywhere in the world. You see that thing she's holding? The idea is so that what is on the left and what is on the right must balance. They must not be the same, but they must balance. Yeah, 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 yeah. Do you get it? So, if, who will I use? Like, come, come, Deborah, come. I can use you for this one. Stretch your hand in two directions. Look at it. If you add weight here, right? What you would have thought that the judge of all the earth will have done? It's come immediately and set it back. But this our God, let me show you what he does. They put a balance here. It goes like this. He's watching. They add. It goes like this. He's watching. They add. It goes like this. He's still watching. They add. It's almost like this one is that, this one is up. Then he waits for them to reach like this. This is, the, this is the sweetness of Zion. Because God will always be just. They were adding gradually because they had to keep adding deception. They were adding gradually, gradually. Because they had to keep adding deception. Then suddenly a generation comes and life is like this. When he shows up as the God of justice, he does not do like this. So imagine the amount of favor that pours out in one day. That's his time every time. There is no day God establishes justice at the point of injustice. He waits for injustice. Injustice enjoying his day. It almost looks like it is unjust to be righteous. Okay, actually, this is the righteous part. This is the... Oh, because the weight they keep adding is to suppress righteousness. At this point, it is a disadvantage to be righteous. It looks like it's good to be wicked. Then when he arises to favor Zion, he does not do his own like this. He won't do that. Like he calls like this. So imagine that all the oppression that has gathered on the earth... For 150 years, 200 years, 1,000 years, 2,000 years of mountain oppression, God shows up and at once decides to settle it. In that day, we are like them that dream. So listen, if there's a son of Zion in the house, what would happen is, as wickedness is adding their scale, what you're asking is, Lord, are you still righteous? Are you still the righteous judge? If you are still the righteous judge, I rejoice. You know why? Because even if I don't receive the just recompense, my children will receive it. And it will be a flood at once. See that word. If you understand this, you will not, oppression will not trouble you. Listen, 
If you go home understanding this, I can rest. God is committed to establishing Zion upon the nations. And yet, God will not do it by partiality or injustice. He will not do it by favoritism. He will do it by righteousness and by justice. So that in that day when his righteousness is revealed, the sons of Zion will ascend their hill as their right. Even the nations will say, it is right. He has done well. If you believe that, let me hear an amen. amen. So, for thy servants take pleasure in her stones and they favor the dust thereof. Well, let me say this. It will return us to the love for Zion so that you can understand it a little more. Are you ready? The stones of Zion. Now, I hope you know that there's a building warfare on the earth. God's recommendation for building every time is stone. The recommendation of building every time for Babylon is bricks. So that you can look even globally right now and find out that the predominant building style is Babylonian. And the Babylonian style of building seems more secure. You know, the world tends towards what is reasonably. And bricks is a collection of equality. Right? Normally, bricks is a collection of equality. And so you interlock bricks to be sure that it stands. Do you understand it? So that every brick becomes the bridge for the next brick. But stones are not a measure of equality. God does not build with bricks. God builds with stones. Sila. Oh. So, if you look at this building, every brick that was used to make this building is the same in size, technically speaking. Technically speaking. If you go to buy blocks, you either buy nine inches blocks or six inches blocks. It's almost impossible for you to mix six inches blocks and nine inches block in building within the same parameter. Within the same parameter. You can possibly get to a pillar and decide I'll continue with six inches here. But even the distortion on the building will show. Do you understand it? Uh, so it's either you're doing six inches blocks or nine inches blocks. Now, bricks are a measure of equality. Stones are not a measure of equality. Stones are not a measure of ability. They are a measure of compatibility by choice. God does not build with bricks. He builds with stones. Aye. Hmm. Is anybody hearing me? Let's, we'll speak about the stones of Zion so that you understand it. First start chapter 2 is easy. Which I told you, you then, as lively stones, are being fit together into a house for the Lord. Ah, and of course, if you read from the Chronicles, you'll find out that when Solomon was building the temple, the Lord gave him an instruction. He said, Every stone must be finished at the quarry site. Do you understand it? Not in the temple. So that there is no noise in the temple. Let me, let me help you understand it. Now, I told you that bricks are a measure of equality. Right? That it is bricks that, that enforce conformity upon you. Do you understand it? Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. So what bricks do is they force conformity upon you. So that even if you are not rich, you have to dress like the rich. So that when you are pair, we look equal. So you find people within the context of conformity bearing a life that they cannot carry. Do you understand it? So for instance, uh, Mr. Jack and his wife. Okay, some of you don't know Mr. Jack. You'll find out later. 
Mr. Jack and his wife can sit down and say, nobody should insult us in that God life. Oh. So we will live up to a standard. And possibly the standard they're talking about is Mr. Ishaku and his wife. Are you following me? Possibly that's the standard. And so Mrs. Jack puts pressure on Mr. Jack to say, I'm not going to carry last long. Don't sir. Everybody for women fellows, you don't buy uniform. You don't know you have left girls brigade now and you're women fellows. You see your life. Now, follow me. So, Mrs. Jack is forcing a Mr. Jack to meet up a standard that because they are trying to catch up with Mr. Ishako. Don't worry, it's not a reality. Cool down. In stone building, Mrs. Jack and Mr. Jack arrive at their sides. And they look for what angle of Mr. Isha could they fit into. Because whatever is left, somebody else will be used to feel. That makes sense? That's how Zion is built. That's why when he returns, even when he returns, our rewards will not be equal. Our stone sizes can never be the same. And yet, everyone will rejoice at the contribution of my tiny stone. Because while I thought my tiny stone was useless, where Mrs. Jack and Mr. Isha could meet, that space there, God needed my size. So stone building is thorough work. Brick building does not require concentration. Any brick can enter any way. So brick building is fast. Stone building takes time. So that if we take the stone that should fit into this place, it almost fits completely. But there's one edge that has grown like this. So it is not falling in. That's a stone that you should chisel. But guess what? The Bible said we should not fix that stone. And chisel it there. You measure the extent to which it is protruding. Then you take it away and take it to the side. Yeah. Damn it. The things that are deficient in me that does not make me fit are not matters to be discussed in church. They are matters for me to go alone into the presence of God and seek his face there quietly until he chisels it off. Lord, I don't like the way everybody is making me angry. What it means is that there's one kulutu, one protrusion in your life. That is not letting you fit. Your protrusion is not our fault. And we are not holding it against you. But we are saying that in stone building, we don't chisel that in the building. God said so that there will be no noise in my house. So what God is against is noise, noise. Every time we make room for noise, God loses something. He loses the holiness of his sanctuary. That's what he loses. The world gets a reason to talk down on his system, not on my account. That's why many times scripture suggests that you would rather suffer wrong can be the reason why noise will happen. Because by the time the noise is happening, what the stone climbing here is saying is, it is Mrs. Jack! Mrs. Jack is saying it is the stone. Listen, Mrs. Jack is not in scene for the shape of her stone, but she enters into scene by the noise of answering the stone that is not fitting. See that?
So when you read carelessly, your servant's favor has to. <laughs> Sorry, your servant's love has to. Mm. Your servants take pleasure in our storms. When you are reading that carelessly, what it means is that as long as he's committed to Zion, together with all his protrusions and all his, the places where we don't fit naturally, I take pleasure in the fact that this God has a vessel. I know he's still working on his vessel. By the time he finishes, he will add, do you remember that I said to you, the person who wears the apostolic clock requires the shouting of joy for those who wait for that deliverance. The shouting for joy is their contribution. No man has run an apostolic journey alone. That's what God rebuked in Elijah when he said, I, only I. God said, look at him. Did, did you forget that when you met Obadiah and told Obadiah to tell Ahab that, what did Obadiah tell him? Obadiah said, haven't you heard how I have taken, is it 700? 700 of the Lord's prophets and I've kept them in two caves, feeding them there night and day. Do you think that all the prophets were doing was sitting down there and eating? So God was saying to Elijah, there are at least 700 people that were praying. That's what Obadiah was telling you. Now, that's the one in the hand of Obadiah. There could have been 10 Obadiah spread across Israel that gave me at least 7,000 prophets who have not bowed the knee. Meaning, if you live now, there are 7,000 possible choices I have. So that you are the apostolic age does not mean that the entire reward is yours. In fact, that you are the apostolic edge means that you should fear. Because you are aggregating the energies that are coming from many people. And so you must relate that energy accurately. I know I'm speaking to a generation. I know that a portion of that generation is listening to me right now. But I also know that there's a portion of that generation that will listen to me later. And you will understand it in the day when it is needed. So God said to him, go, anoint Jehu, anoint Isaiah, and anoint Elisha, prophet in your stead. Stop. The Elisha they told him to anoint as prophet in his stead. He met him a farmer. No, no, no. No pedigree, no track record. What he was doing now, didn't look like. Let me take a quick digression. You understand. Me. I was speaking with somebody today, right? And I said to them, how, how many services have you entered into that they told you that it was a miracle that ravens fed Elijah? How many times? How many times? Countless times. Right? Have you ever entered a service and they said to you, ravens will feed you and you shouted amen? Let me tell you the implication. Elijah was leading prophet in Israel. Could have been comfortable. At least had a house. Had a place to sleep. Made an announcement. And that announcement turned him into a vagabond. So when ravens were bringing him food, I hope you know he was hiding. I hope you know that when ravens were bringing him food, he possibly had cleared a portion of small bush and created a hut to block himself from the sun and the rain. And he sat down there every day, morning, afternoon, night, possibly in prayer and study. And all he did was walk out to the brook at a time. And when he drinks the water from the brook, he sees the raven coming. Then the raven drops him meat. Excuse me, how is that a miracle to Elijah? Was he hungry before he declared the word of the Lord? While you are thinking of the technology called Raven, 
you have eliminated all of the circumstances around Elijah. And so when you are saying, ravens will bring me meat, all you are saying is stingy people will give me money. What you don't know is that to provoke ravens to bring you meat, there are declarations you must have made that have turned you into a caveman. So do you actually want a raven miracle? This is the simple answer. The answer is that nobody in his right senses will prophesy upon you that ravens will feed you. You must have entered a state that your apostolic declaration has put you in trouble. Ravens feeding Elijah was nothing near comfort. Then I said, you know, we sing, what a marvelous God. What a marvelous God. He has done marvelous. In Elijah's case, what a wicked God. Because, you know what? If you can send ravens to bring food, sir, why would you stop the brook from, why would you stop the brook from drying? Why didn't you save me from them? Then the brook died. Instead of you to come and bust oasis, you now told me that you travel on foot to Zarephath. That I will meet a widow there. Since I don't have sense, I'll stay in the house of widow. And I'm not the one walking and feeding the widow. It's the widow that's supposed to be feeding me. Who grown man? Some miracles in the Bible are not miracles. They are very painful. And of course, I've, I've taught you to say before that the homestead of Baal is Zarephath. So God took Elijah to Zarephath to bind Baal. And yet, God did not announce to Elijah, Behold, I send you to Zarephath. You shall find Baal there. If Elijah did not follow the constraints, of what you now preach as miracle, he will have never found that this is where Baal came from and this is who I must bind. So when he came out from Zarephath, was when he said to Obadiah, go and tell Ahab, I'm looking for him. The confidence of go and tell Baal, I'm looking for him, is because Elijah now knew that the God that Baal and Jezebel trust in, I have finished with them. So let them come and finish with their children. That's why he told them, cry louder. He said, maybe he's sleeping. Elijah knew that where Baal was now, he cannot answer. He knows what they used to bind him. He said, let me close this Zion and Babylon. Talk. Please sit down, darling. That means that to take pleasure in the stones of Zion means that every man that God is viewing in the context of what he wants to do for the advancement of his kingdom, you must learn to love. In fact, it gets worse when the Bible says it flavor the dust. Because I found that everywhere you find dust in scripture, it is speaking about falling nature. That's the element. Why do you think that he said for thy servants take pleasure in the stores and favor the dust? Why do you think so? It's because if you can love the stone and favor the dust, you will love Zion. Have you ever heard somebody say something like this? Okay, let me close. I don't want us to close too late. Have you ever heard somebody say like this? Something like this. This man, I like this man, you're a very good guy. But there's one thing I cannot stand about him. That's the dust. Do you understand? Let me tell you. You know, you know these dockers. I like these dockers. I'm telling you, very good game. But there is something. That's the dust. 
That's the gospel. Listen, there's nobody who loves Zion that does not lay down their lives to defend and protect the stones and the dust of Zion. It's, you cannot, you are an enemy of God if church is your subject in front of unbelievers. Oh, I wish there's another way to say it. You hate God. If you sit down with unbelievers to discuss the weakness of the church, you hate God. You love yourself. What you're actually trying to do is you're trying to prove that you are the one who is right. Everybody else is wrong. And you don't redeem the name of God like that. There's a season when I set out to do a restorative work for someone who had fallen. And when I started to speak with people around that restorative work, I said, this is the problem. The problem is that by the time the story of your fall comes out, sir, it's not only you that would have fallen. We will all fall. Because everybody will believe that this is what every young minister is doing. So even you, the young minister, who is taking a self-righteous stand and saying, this brother Joseph, we have warned him many times. We knew there's women that would kill him. What you don't know is that Babylon is not killing Joseph. Babylon is looking for Zion. Joseph is only a subject because he's represented as Zion. It's part of the reasons why the speaking voice when we assemble in God's present Zion is the voice of the blood of the sprinkling. I, I told you that's supposed to be my last verse. Oh. Listen. The morning of Zion begins to become a reality for you when you become conscious of the heavenly existing Zion. Or oh, maybe when I come back from my next set of many journeys, I'll slow down and teach this. Understand it. You must know the natural type of Zion as built by David. You must know the prophetic type of Zion as spoken of by the prophets. And then you must know the ideal of Zion as revealed in the New Testament as a heavenly assembly. Now, anybody who has a foretaste of the ideal of Zion that's the heavenly assembly. Knows how many things are wrong on earth. And that's the basis for his mourning. The glorious possibility you meet in the heavenly Zion. That has not yet taken effect. In the assembly that is supposed to represent Zion on earth. But guess what? Everyone who arrives at the assembly of the heavenly Zion. The only voice that speaks when we assemble in Zion is the voice of the blood of the sprinkling. And the reason why it is the voice of the blood of the sprinkling that is speaking now, not because that's the only voice that we keep speaking. The voice of the blood of the sprinkling will keep speaking in the heavenly Zion, waiting for the earthly Zion to be cleansed and raised to stature by reason of that which the blood has done. That means that you don't have the right to speak about what God is still working on. Aya. Zion is calling. Do you, do you understand it? You understand it? What is speaking right now? The voice of the blood of the sprinkling. Right? And in the voice of the blood of the sprinkling, everything that comes to Zion hears mercy, forgiveness, restoration. Everything that is outside of Zion hears judgment, a scattering, and a reordering. So the voice of the blood is like a double-edged sword. Within Zion, it speaks mercy. Outside of Zion, it speaks judgment. Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12. 
Am I making any sense tonight? I hope I did not bore you tonight. Right? What's important for me that this? Hebrews chapter 12. Start from verse 24. Start from 19. 19. Hebrews 12, 19. It becomes my highest word. Okay, I was waiting for that. And all that I am. Go back to 16. Responds to who you are. It becomes my highest praise. 17. Just to know you more. 18. Ah, it becomes my highest praise. When all that I am responds to who you are, it becomes my highest praise just to know you. Look at this scripture. It started by telling you that this present Zion is more about fellowship than it is about judgment. Is that correct? For you are not come to a mount that cannot that might be touched and that burnt with fire, nor unto and and tempest. Nin 19, 19, 19, quickly, 19, 19. And the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words. Which voice begged that? That means it started by telling you that this Zion to which you are called to assemble is not designed to instill fear. Are you following me? It's clear now. Say it's clear. Uh -uh. Okay. I'm getting five years. So some people don't look sure. So let me slow down. You are not come to a mount that can be touched. That burns with fire, darkness, gloomness, smoke, or the sound of a trumpet. That means that mountain that you came to had all of this at once. The voice of plenty words. Which voice? Everyone that heard it just said, oh, sir, please, this mountain, we don't want to come there. Then they told Moses, Moses, just hear it and come back to us. Then hear what Moses told them. For they could not endure that which was commanded. If so be that as much as a beast touched the mountain, it shall be stoned or thrust through with a doubt. That was 21. Look at this. And so terrible was the sight that Moses that they said to God, listen to God. What did he say? simply put says to you Zion in the New Testament context is not supposed to instill fear. Because verse 22 starts with the word what? Uh, 21. Go back. Ah. I saw the words uh, Moses said I exceedingly fear and quake. Next verse 22. Let me see. What's the first word there? But. That means contrary to this. That means that one of the weapons in Zion is deep fellowship. But not just fellowship with one another. You have come to Mount Zion and the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels who are given in Zion for service. Next verse. To the general assembly and church of the firstborn. Alright? I hope you know that you belong to the general assembly and church of the firstborn. And that when he spoke about the general assembly, what he was speaking about was a combination of the church of the firstborn and the spirit of the just man made perfect. The General Assembly is a combination of the church of the firstborn and the spirit of just men made perfect. When we meet in Zion, we meet as the church of the firstborn. They meet as the spirit of just men made perfect. We meet in a General Assembly. That means in Zion, the living have their meeting 
as the church of the firstborn. The dead have their meeting as the spirit of just men made perfect. We meet together as the general assembly. And to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men, made perfect. Next verse, 24. That's why I said 24 at first. And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, yes, go ahead, and to the blood of the sprinkling, which speaks better things than that of Abel. Don't forget that why they rejected the first mountain was that they could not bear the words that were spoken. Now it tells you that in this mountain, the speaker is the blood. Okay. I didn't say the speaker is Jesus. The speaker is the blood of Jesus. Let me put a clear distinction between the two. It's very simple. It's not even very complex. If Jesus speaks, he will speak from the standpoint of his perfection. His person in the Trinity and his God manifestation. If the blood speaks, he speaks redemption. Because the right to redemption is in the blood. You need to understand that the Jesus who shed his blood has got a dual personality now. He's not only man, he's also God. Do you understand me? So he has to speak from the standpoint of humanity because what Zion is waiting for now is for the earth to catch up with heaven. That means, listen to this, every, every authoritative thing in that constituent assembly has the right to speak, but only after the voice of the blood has perfected its work. Let me try one more time. So God, the judge of all, has the right to speak, but only after the blood is done. Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, has the right to speak, but only after the blood is done. Why? Because it is the blood that makes for the imperfection of those who have come to God in Zion and brings them into perfection by cleansing. But that's not the only thing the blood does. It will also explain to you that that blood, when it speaks, causes a shaking for the removing of the things that are shaken so that only the things that are eternal will remain. So the working of that blood is a double-edged sword because to speak better things than the blood of Abel cannot be to speak judgment. That means when it speaks to us, that's why I started by telling you, you have not come to that terror. You have come in Zion. Listen to this. And this is how the apostolic mandate in Zion is carried. You have come in Zion to a voice that speaks into your weakness and is committed to your perfecting. Because if you, have no, if you still remember yesterday in, in Psalm 50, I established with you that God wants to sign out of Zion but as the perfection of beauty. We also establish in Psalm 102 that when he shall have built up Zion, he appears in glory. That means the process of shall have built up Zion is what is happening now when we assemble in Hebrews chapter 12. Because what then happens is that the voice must speak the stature of Jesus into soul P. So that everything that is in soul P that does not agree with the stature of the beauty of Jesus is dealt with in our general assembly. Because when God decides to reveal himself in Zion, he will not be revealing himself, he will be revealing himself through weak vessels, but he will not be revealing himself through weaklings. I wish you heard me. Let me reduce this long story and cut it short. Right? Should I cut this long story short? It means that my primary commitment to the day of Zion's beauty is my yielding to the voice of the blood to cleanse my imperfections and walk in me a stature that makes Zion beautiful in the day of its appearing. That's simpler, right? That's easier. 
Because let me tell you, in the day of the appearing, people can travel back 35 years and go to Chicago to look for your certificate. I wish you understand what I just said. There has got to be a present testimonial in your life that is too strong for them to find your forged certificate. I wish people are hearing my quotes. Yeah. What I'm saying to you is, out of Zion, the perfection of beauty hath God shine. It's yes, Piva, he wants me to close by force. Because of that, now we're closing 45 minutes. I don't need my Bible to preach. Wickedness. Eh? School of service has online meeting. That's my business. We're not closing today. Oh. Because of this test speed, it is 9.30, we'll close. Osh has locked the door. <clears throat> Listen to me. Listen to me. When he carried my, I knew that something was wrong. If it's somebody else that carries it, I know that. But SP, I know. I'm not safe. Now, understand this. Understand this. You need to get it. All right? And my hope is that this does not cancel everything else you heard. Because, you know, many believers in the name of consecration do nothing. We are waiting to feel perfect. Before we engage, listen, let me tell you, if it's perfect feeling, you will never feel perfect. Even when they soak you inside the blood of Jesus and they rinse you inside Holy Spirit water, oh, you don't understand what I'm saying. You will stand in Zion. The blood will speak, 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 speak. He knows that you're not feeling it. So they'll ask two angels to carry you, soak you inside the blood. They'll bring you out. They tell you, is there any part of your body that's not inside the blood? You say, I feel under my, they will soak you back. When they bring you out, they say, where is that river of pure crystal flowing from the water? Rinse him there. They rinse you. Some of you, when they do that, if you appear on it, you still feel like God is still working on me. Do you understand what I mean? Listen, let me tell you the truth. Nobody ever feels ready for engagement. If, if what you are waiting for is to feel ready, you will waste your entire life. What I'm saying to you is that Zion is committed to the process of your redemption. You must be yielded to let Zion redeem you. Are you following me? Zion is committed to your redemption. You must yield to let Zion redeem you. But your redemption is not the only subject we discuss in Zion. So right now the voice of the blood is speaking. What is he speaking? Is speaking cleansing, speaking perfecting, raising the weak, making them strong, so that when the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion, we were like them that dream. In that day, they will say, We didn't think that that thing they were doing behind that place was serious. Do you understand it? Oh, we thought it was just a bunch of young people meeting there. And one pastor lying to them. We did not know that that's the foundation upon which the deliverance of the state is coming. That's the foundation upon which the deliverance of the nation is coming. Listen, in the day when you become deliverer, you will not feel different. You will just know the spirit of the Lord God is upon me. So let the voice of the Lord speak. And let me tell you, when you arrive in Zion, your brain does not know it. But everything around your life begins to shake. I'm telling you. Every time the voice of the blood is speaking over you, when you rise up, you suddenly realize, I held this thing before. I let it go. This thing had a place in my life before. I've thrown it off. I thought I could not do this before, but I can do all things through Christ. You suddenly start to see new abilities jumping out of you. That way you know that the voice of God in Zion has spoken over you. It's when you come out of Zion that you realize that there's fresh zeal to do more. 
You just come out and suddenly you want to do. Understand that it's God who is at work in you, both willing and doing of his good pleasure. So the next time you say to yourself, I am come unto Mount Zion. What you are saying in context is I have come to the God who perfects me to use me to end the madness in the world because when the spirit of the Lord God is upon me he binds the broken heart proclaims deliverance to the captive no man who comes to God before everyone that comes before God in Zion they go from strength to strength. Their faces are enlightened. They have no reason to be ashamed. Now you understand that Zion is a system. Zion is our coming together. And Zion is the advancement of God. If you understand it every time, when you come together and we lift up our hands, you will suddenly, the entire room will disappear before your eyes. You will start to see innumerable company of angels. Then you will know, ah, that's Timothy, ah, that's Paul, ah, that's Abraham, that's David. You will know that where you are standing is completing a journey that started long before you. There is no way you can carry that kind of consciousness and enter a worship service carelessly. Because you know that the moment you say, we have come to the Lord, the moment you say it, the room tears open. A mountain is elevated. We are suddenly standing before the presence of the Most High. And understand, it's not you have come, it's we have come. It's an assembly of us together. Zion is an assembly. It's not in your room. The assembly calls I. So you will have seen three things I showed you today. The advancement calls I. The assembly calls I. The system calls I. When you stand and you say, this is Mount Zion. What you are saying is God is here. The spirit of judgment everywhere. Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. The Holy Spirit. The blood of the sprinkling innumerable company of angels. If you wear that consciousness, the miraculous becomes easy. Believe me, you will run into a service. You won't even be waiting for anybody to announce, ah, God is here and you have an ulcer. No, you have a sore throat. No, you have a headache. No, you have a cancer. You will just say to yourself, there are certain things that cannot assemble to Zion. Then you will tell the cancer, follow me, I'm going to Zion. That's where you die. Do you understand it? Then when everybody comes and we lift up our hands, the room disappears before you. You are suddenly conscious. God is here. And that's where Zion beautifies her stones. That's where Zion polishes her stones. It is when we come before the Lord like that, that he pours his beauty upon us. He speaks better things than the things we are used to. Just lift up your hand there and stand in Zion, the city of the living God. This is Zion. This is Zion. There are angels everywhere. This is Zion. This is Zion. Burdens lift here in Zion. Sicknesses are healed here in Zion. The oil of joy drops here in Zion. Our stones are purified here in Zion. This is where the gold plating of stones happens. 
so that we have this treasure hid in earthen vessels. This is Zion, the city of the living God. And now I announce that everything the blood has paid for that you are suffering from is cursed now. Everything the blood paid for that is not yet established in your life, I decree it comes now. Standing in Zion, the perfection of beauty, I ask that every area of your life that requires perfecting in beauty, whether in your natural body, in your mind, in the flow from your spirit, I decree that the hand of the Lord perfects you now. I see a strange ailment leaving. I see it leaving. Certain things have begun to gather up on you. I mean, you know, that they, they have begun to gather up on you. I see a strange growth on a, a, a man's organ. And I'm not talking about your, your private organ. I'm speaking about a man's organ. I see it looks like the lungs or the kidney or something. Something is growing there. Now standing in Zion, I curse it to its roots. Whatever the heavenly father has not planted, we uproot it now in the name of Jesus. Standing here in Zion, I speak the restoration of sound mind. Someone under the sound of my voice, it suddenly feels like the frequency in your mind is bridging. So many times you have to stop to recollect. I end that affliction now. By the voice of the blood of Jesus, we end that affliction now. Everything that does not make for the per perfection of beauty, we stand today and we decree it gone from you. Amen. And today we agree. This is Zion, the city of the living God. Lord stirs up your waters from deep within makes you deeply jealous for her stones and for her dust that even the things that as it were tampers with the beauty of Zion you will protect from your heart in the name of the Lord Jesus the Lord is a sun and shield he gives grace and glory. No good thing would he withhold. I, I answer the question of someone under the sound of my voice. You asked even this evening, will the Lord have me have it? I answer you in this place. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. I decree in the name of Jesus, before you wake up in the morning, you will wake up to the miracle of that thing waiting for you. Thank you, Father. This is Zion, the city of the living God. This is Zion. The conglomeration of the systems of the living God. This is where he rules. Lord, let the portion of them over whom you rule be our portion. The rod of the wicked will not rest upon our Lord. Strengthened by your spirit. Blessed be your name, Father. Blessed be your name, Father. We love you. We go tonight conscious that this apostolic mandate of bringing the nations to your feet is before us and the Spirit of the Lord God is upon us. That when we 
we return, we return with singing to Zion. Everlasting joy upon our heads. We obtain gladness and joy. Sorrow and sighing are far from us. We bless you, our Father. Thank you for the things you're working in. Oh, thank you, Lord. I feel like we should bust out in prophecy tonight. Find a brother or a sister. Hold them by the hand. Pray in the spirit as quietly as you can. And speak the word of the Lord to them. Just one brother, one sister each. One brother. Just find one person. And pray in the spirit. Every word of comfort the Lord speaks to your heart as you prayed for them and with them. Declare it. Declare it. Declare it. Declare it. This is holy ground. Even now. This is holy ground, my friend. This is holy ground. Hear me now. This is holy ground, my friend. Open your eyes. Open your ears. Soon you'll understand that the Lord is here. Open your eyes. Open your ears. Soon you'll understand that the Lord is here. speak to the person whose hand you held and tell them what you perceive the spirit of the Lord God is saying is that the comfort of the Lord one after the other and we're done for the night so start turn to somebody to your left and tell them this is what I perceive this is what the Lord is saying in my heart to say to you Zion the city of the living There's a right ear that has suffered from some clogging and partial dumbness. While you speak, 
the Lord says to announce to you that that ear is open. The ear is open. You had a problem hearing clearly from your right ear. You sound, you know, very dim. The Lord says to say to you, it is open. Uh, if the first person is still speaking, round up so that the second person can speak. We are closing already. That's exactly where we will close. God is ministering comfort. And I'm sure you know by now that comfort is not because somebody died. No. It's ministering comfort. It's bringing you to the place where you can sum up the things that you've done before now to know that you've always been in this plan. And give you possible directions as to the things that lie ahead of you. Amen. Father, we go tonight comforted, strengthened by the word of the Lord. We go tonight jealous for Zion. We go tonight zealous to build Zion. We go tonight by the strength of the Lord. We give you praise. In Jesus name. Amen. If you receive a word of comfort, a word of prophecy, a word of consolation, and you are sure it was accurate, just wave at me. Can you say, this is Zion. Is the city of the living God. The ministry of comfort abounds in Zion. And from time to time, we will let the Lord just do this. So that every time you come, you know God is conscious of me. He's conscious of my journeys. He's conscious of where I stand. Do you feel comforted? Yes. Hallelujah. If you were still speaking, please make sure the person who is speaking. Is there anybody who is still speaking? Wave. Let me see. So that we can wait for you. All right. Everyone is done. God bless you. See you. When? Tomorrow? Yeah, see you tomorrow in church for school of the Bible.